Welcome to Design to the Nines. I'm Natalie Callahan, and if this is the first time we're meeting, welcome to my channel. For today's episode, I have compiled some of my favorite upcycled DIY decor. We're talking trash that I've turned into treasure, thrift finds that I've upgraded, or things that I had around my home that I gave new life. I hope you enjoy watching this as much as I enjoyed putting it together for you. So let's get DIYing and designing to the nines. I'm gonna show you how I took some tuna cans, a couple of cookie sheets, and dog chains from the Dollar Tree and built this designer knockoff chandelier for a fraction of the cost. For my project today, I am going to be knocking off a designer item. This time it's from Ballard Designs. I found a beautiful chandelier that was $529 and I really loved it, but I wanted to see if I can do it for a lot less. I'm going to be using some really interesting items. I think you might even actually question my sanity a little bit when I pull out some of the items, but that's what you got to do is you got to get creative. You got to think outside of the box, but I promise you that they're going to work and it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to show you three interesting things that I'm using. The first is I'm going to be using some cookie sheets from the Dollar Tree. I think they're going to really work for part of our project. And then I'm using three of these six foot dog tie out cables. So like a dog chain from the Dollar Tree again. And then finally, and this is a little bit odd, I am using eight tuna cans like empty tuna cans so we've had a lot of tuna sandwiches recently okay so we're going to start by building the frame of the chandelier first and i picked up three of these 36 inch long one and a half by one and a half inch poplar pieces of lumber from home depot but we are going to keep two of them the original length and then we are going to take the third one and cut it directly in half we're going to just go ahead and mark that and make that cut now So a couple quick safety tips. Normally I have some clear protective eyewear for my saw. I couldn't find them, so we're gonna make do with my sunglasses, but that's just to prevent any sawdust from getting in your eyes. In between each use, I always unplug it because I have little people around and I just don't want them accidentally, you know, turning it on like that and hurting themselves even if I'm gonna only be away from it for just a second. We're gonna be building the frame for the chandelier. I didn't want anything exposed like in the way of nails or anything on the end. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna insert dowels inside the joint to keep it all nice and put together. We're gonna take the one of the long ones and we are going to Take a nail and put it in about the center. Tap it into place, make sure it's nice and level. And then you take some wire clippers and you clip off the head of the nail so then it's kind of sharp. And then we're gonna line it up on this table. And then we take our hammer and tap it into place. And what that's gonna do is make a mark where your starting hole should be and then we can just take this nail and pull it out so now you've got a, a starting point for each joint drill nice and straight and then we do the same thing to this so roughly this is going to work we're probably going to need to do a little sanding around the joints but that's okay before we glue this together and finalize it then you're just going to add some wood glue in the holes and if a little bit gets through that's okay because then it will help strengthen that joint. For a much tighter joint I highly recommend using a clamp. So I've let my frame dry overnight so I'm going to take off the clamp now and then what we're going to do is we're going to sand the frame because we want a nice um, smooth surface. Using a sander makes it so much faster. <laughs> So I decided to move the party inside um, because I didn't know how the humidity and heat would work with the stains. I'm doing it in our guest bathroom because this is an area that is not getting used right now and then I can also turn on the fans for circulation and all of that. I'm going to put on some gloves to protect my fancy manicure that I still don't have. <laughs> no, I'm just doing this because it's going to get messy and I don't want to have a stain all over my hands. And then I've got a cast off sock that 
its partner probably got eaten by my dryer, like so many socks do. Just gonna dunk my hand in the stain, and I'm just using a gel stain because I thought it would work a little bit better and give us a nice thick coat. And that is going on very dark, which is kind of good because that's kind of what I wanted. The next step in the process is creating the iron strapping that was on the wood frame. And you're gonna need protective gloves for this step because you're gonna be exposed to some sharp edges and it's really important to protect your hands so you don't get cuts. They're not very expensive at all and definitely worth it. Then you're gonna take your tin snips and cut off the lip of the cookie sheet, leaving just the bottom part. Then you're gonna take that part and cut two and a half inch strips. Then you are ready to spray paint, which we will just spray paint all of the tuna cans anything that's going to be metal we're going to use the leftover spray paint from my project last week and spray everything a nice flat iron looking black so i've let everything dry for several hours and hopefully it is all dry enough to do my next step we're going to start with the iron the iron <laughs> the pretend iron um, strapping that was made from cookie sheets and we've sprayed it in that um, outdoor flashing that black is I'm going to start on the inside so the rough side is right underneath the tuna can <laughs> tuna can oh my goodness and so we're going to just fold it around and get it on there and it should just bend really nicely and then we're going to put a little pressure and pull it up and bend it all the way around and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to make a little mark here and then i'm going to grab my tin snips that i left inside so i'm going to go grab those and i'm going to take this off we are going to trim it to fit to kind of keep everything in place i'm going to take my tuna can and i've kind of punched a little hole in this set this on top so i'm going to drill pilot so that is set. Then I'm going to switch my tip to a traditional tip. I'm just using drywall screws. I had them on hand. You could probably use whatever you want. And then we are going to screw this right into place. Look at that. So that is on there good. That will help the fake iron strap to stay in place good. And we'll do that all the way along. So you can see right here, I have a little bit of an issue and I did know that this was gonna happen. And what it is, is it's just where this seam is meeting up. And I've got some, you know, E6000 on there, but it doesn't wanna stay down because it wants to bend out. So my solution for this, and it's also kind of an aesthetic thing as well, on the um, original there's some nail heads and I just am going to I took these thumbtacks and I sprayed them the same color so I press those in and not only does that hold it into place but it adds kind of an aesthetic as well so and anywhere that I'm scratching on this iron work I'm planning on going back in and touching up Next, I drill pilot holes into the wooden round in a square shape for the hooks that will hold the chain supports. Then I place another thumbtack in the center for an added decorative touch. So on the edges, I've come in two and a half by three quarters. We're gonna pre-drill the screws for the hooks where we're gonna attach our cables. All right, so I'm getting ready to hang my light fixture and I had my husband come out earlier and help me mark where we were gonna need to put it because it was kind of a two person job because we had to kind of center in between the two light fixtures, you can get and see. Um, and apparently he did not want me to miss where he marked. So I need to determine whether or not 
there's a stud up there. So I'm gonna use a stud finder. That would be most ideal because obviously that would be the most secure. Um, if not, I do have a toggle that I can put into the drywall which would support up to 50 pounds worth of weight, which should be more than plenty because my light fixture is nowhere near that. Um, so let's go see if there's a stud. There's a stud in my house. Let's see if there's a stud up there. No stud. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna be using the toggle. So I wanted to show you before I hung it that I attached the cables to the hooks right here and over here and so on all corners and then I connected it right there as well. My project is done, it's hung. I am so thrilled with how it turned out. I feel like it's a really good dupe and a really good knockoff of the Valor design. My version came in at around $60. There is a way to do it for about half the cost and that would include switching out the candles for some from the Dollar Tree. This is the Dollar Tree version and this is my version. Now, the reason I went with these candles is because the Dollar Tree one, you would have to manually turn on each and every time you use it. You have to get up and, and switch that out. My version, you actually can turn on with a remote and off with a remote, so it's really cool. They're a little bit beefier. I'm really glad I spent the extra money, but if you're looking for a little bit more budget-friendly solution, switch out for the Dollar Tree candles. I am going to be converting this old tire that would be on its way to the landfill into a functioning piece of furniture. And we're actually gonna be turning this into an ottoman. And I am so excited to do this because, you know, how many times do we have a tire sitting around our garage kicking around, taking up space. If you don't already have a tire in your garage, you could totally just ask around. Somebody will be happy to give you a free tire. So let's start, let's do it. Okay, so for the first part, we need to put a top and a bottom on this tire so it has some stability, so it can actually hold um, something in the middle of it without caving in. And so I picked up this piece of lumber at Home Depot for $4 and we should be able to get the top and bottom out of it. If you had a bigger tire, you might need a little bit pe bigger piece of wood, but you can use anything, any scrap wood you can get your hands on that's in a sheet form. And what we're going to need to do is make a circle. And so the easiest way to do that is to find center all right, so we're basically gonna be using this entire piece of wood. We need to be very careful in our measurements because we don't really have a lot to spare. We need to find the center. X marks the spot. So then we're gonna take a nail, put it on the center of that, tap it in just a little bit, flip knot that on there. And then we need to take some sort of um, writing utensil and we're gonna just tie it so it hits the edge here. And in theory, we should be able to do a circle. Okay, so I have a jigsaw here and we are gonna cut out the circle that we just traced. And honestly, best practice would be a much sturdier table than mine, but I do have it clamped down and we're gonna just be a little careful here. And we are just going to cut the circle out. It's a little humid outside, so I brought the party inside. We do this, we kind of go in and out. It's just how we roll here. Anyways, so we've got our top and our bottom cut out of the wood, and now we need to adhere it. I have some leftover liquid nails, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna squeeze some of this liquid nails. This will just help everything kind of stay into place. We are gonna put this right on top. It's not gonna be perfect. It's cut with a jigsaw, and so there's just gonna be some waviness, and I thought that was okay. I'm gonna screw it down just for added measure. Now I flipped it over, and we're gonna do the same thing on the bottom side so that we will have a place to screw in some feet. 
I'm going to be wrapping rope around the entirety of the tire and the top, and then we'll put on some feet to make an ottoman. I got this rope, it's about 50 feet of rope, it's a half inch thick, and I really liked it, and it was really the best price that I could find, and it also had the look that I liked. And I got it at Michael's, it was regularly $16.99, and I used a 50% off coupon. You always have to use a 50% off or 40% off coupon. Michael's always has one. So I got this rope half off, making it $8.50 for 50 feet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start right in the center, and X marks the spot. We still have that from when we did our circle earlier. I'm gonna use a mixture of liquid nails and some hot glue. The hot glue kind of has more of an immediate contact and the liquid nails will be way more durable. I've actually seen some of these rope ottomans before and one of the problems with them is the rope unravels. And we're gonna prevent that because I've got a, a trick to show you. What we're gonna do is we can see that it's wound this way and we are gonna create a lashing. What you need to do is create a loop like this and then we are going to line it up like so and then we are going to wind in the opposite direction and we're going to do about three or four loops and make sure they're kind of snug and then when you get those three or four loops what you're going to do is i've just started and made like a tight coil and we've already got where x marks the spot so I'm gonna start by doing some hot glue. And I'm just gonna be very generous there. And then I'm also gonna put some construction adhesive, cause that's gonna hold up better over time. Make sure that that's nice and center. And then all we're gonna do is just keep doing this all the way around. You just want to make sure you get it really nice and tight together. You don't want any gaps. This is going to be a little bit time consuming, so we're in it for the long haul. <laughs> We've made good progress, it's looking really good. And now I'm at a place where I need to transition from the wood to the tire. So the idea is to try to kind of make this transition as seamless and unnoticeable as possible. Okay, so what we're gonna be using for the feet of our ottoman these are actually just some finials that I got at Home Depot for $3.98 a piece. And I liked them because they were a little bit chunkier, they had a flat bottom, and I just thought that they would be the perfect height and everything about it worked, and the price was right. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna stain them right now. So I'm just using the same Kona gel stain that I've used for my outdoor tuna can chandelier and then I've used it on my bench. I have hardly made a dent on it and so I'm going to use it on this as well. And it's in like a nice dark chocolate which will actually contrast next to the rope really well. Oh yeah, that looks so good. I love it. Patience is going to be a virtue in this project. Now it's time to attach our feet, and I've kind of marked where I wanted them. I've kind of evenly spaced them out. And now we're gonna pre-drill for the feet. And then we are just gonna twist them right into place. And again, these are just fence finials. Um, you could use actual furniture feet but I found them pretty pricey and these were smooth and perfect for what we're doing.
months ago, I finally discovered a relatively decent thrift store in my area and I picked up this poop brown. <gasps> I just said that. <laughs> But that's the color of it. It is the ugliest shade of brown painted console table for about 20 bucks. So that was a really good deal. It was very sturdy. It was made of real wood. And so I liked that. And I liked the overall shape and idea of it. It has good bones here. So I really think that we can make this into something absolutely amazing by adding some doors, maybe adding some furniture feet and some really cool hardware. And it is gonna look nothing like this when we're done with it. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is build a door and we're gonna build it kind of shaker styles. And this is just a scrap piece of wood that's left over from my shelf build here in my craft room and so this i had on hand already so we're going to just take some of this poplar and it's two and a half inches wide by 36 inches and i've used this before to kind of dress up a door and we're going to create kind of like a shaker door I always like to wear protective eyewear whenever I'm working with anything that could spit up some sawdust. I also have an apron on because, well, why get dirtier than you need to? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to be using a circular saw that's cordless and this will work perfect for what we're doing. So the first thing we're going to do is mark our measurements, which is 19 and 3 quarters inch. And then we can use just one of our trim pieces to connect the dots and make sure that everything matches up. So we've got that marked. And then all we need to do is there's this red release button here. And if we push that down and pull the trigger at the same time, then it will start like that. That first we got to line it up with the blade and then we're going to hold on. And it was easy as that. Okay, so we've got our door cut down to the dimensions that we want, and so it's the right size. And now we're gonna add some trim. I picked this up at the Home Depot for a couple bucks. And all we're gonna do is just lay it on top of here, make sure it's flush with the edge here on both sides. And then we're gonna take our pencil, this is a little trick I like to do, and just trace. And then we know how long it is. And then we're gonna keep this excess because it's gonna be the rail. So these are the styles and this will be the rail to our top and the other one will be to the bottom. So we're only gonna need two of these per door. All right, now it's time to use my miter saw and this is gonna make the job so easy. Now, when working with it, again, safety glasses, this is really easy to do. All we need to do is line up the edge of our blade with our line and then pull the release again, it's the yellow, and then grab the trigger and push down, and we've got this. All right, so now we need to do the style, or the, I mean, the rail. So we're just gonna make sure this is all lined up. Gonna mark that. So you can see that this fits nicely there. So we can use this as a pattern for our next one. All right, so you can see that we've got a door shaping up really nicely. So now all we're gonna do is take some Gorilla Wood glue and glue it down to this piece. And then I'm gonna take my nail gun that I'm gonna show you how to use here and just put a couple of finished nails into it so that it's very secure. So now I'm gonna show you how to use this nail gun. They do make electric nail guns. Mine is run by an air compressor. And the first thing we need to do is put in some small little finished nails. These are tiny, they're pretty short, but they will work perfectly for what we're doing. So we just do that by placing them right inside here. And this is like a finished brad nailer. And then we're gonna just slowly close that and now we need to hook it to our hose <laughs> and then we're gonna pull this back stick this in and release and then it's snugly on so now we're ready to turn it on and the thing to remember about tank pressure is that 
if it's going in too far then you need to reduce the pressure if it's not going in far enough you need to increase the pressure but I usually keep the dials about right in the middle and so we're going to turn that on now and build the pressure and when it stops making the noise then we know it's ready to use the air compressor so now it's time to assemble this door so we're going to just flip this over maybe take off this sticker <laughs> but then we're going to take our Gorilla wood glue and we're going to squeeze a little on flip this over and you may want to just jiggle it a little bit to get that wood glue spread out a little bit and then we're going to make sure that everything lines up we're going to put in a, a couple of finish nails push it down that acts as the release and then we pull the trigger. And then I'll do it on this other side before we do a second one. All right, there we go. And then we'll just move forward. And there we have a door. Isn't it awesome? We built this. We just need to build the second one and then meet me back inside. So we've got our doors and they're done and they're so cute. But now I wanna add some dimension by adding a top on top. <laughs> this I got at Lowe's already cut to size. Our table is 48 inches and this is 48 inches. So it's really not gonna add any dimension on the side, but it is a little bit deeper than this. And so it will add some dimension this way. So I like that. We're gonna glue and nail it down to the top, but we need a little bit longer nail. So I'm gonna show you how we're gonna switch that out. We're just gonna push that down, open that up. And then we're gonna take our smaller finish nail, which was perfect for what we were just doing and quickly switch it out for one that's a little bit longer. So we're just gonna pop that in there, shut it, and it's good to go. So then we'll put glue on this. Even though our nails are shorter than these two thicknesses, just to be safe, I'm gonna line it up right here with the sides and that way, you know, if anything crazy happens, it will go into the right place. So now I'm just gonna take some dry dex spackling and spackle up all the nail holes on our doors and on the top and make any patches that might be necessary. Then we're gonna sand it up and then we're gonna paint everything but the base and you'll see why in just a second. I'm just using leftover paint from my stripes on my walls here in the craft room. The paint color is called Hail Navy. Just take your time painting, do a good job, and make sure there are no drips. Okay, so I flipped our console over and the reason why is because I want to add decorative feet. I want to get rid of this angled, ugly bottom. It's like, I don't know. I just really didn't like the look of it. So we're going to take it off. And some of you might be asking why I didn't do this at the beginning. And the reason is, is because I knew I was going to be painting it in place and I wanted it to be lifted up off the floor so that I could paint easier and not have to worry about that. So I've got a hammer and I'm just going to try I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to do this, but we're going to give it a whirl. It's on there pretty good. Yes. Look at that. Maybe I can turn it into a, like a blanket ladder or something. <laughs> I don't know. Now I'm gonna get the rest of the, like the rusty nails out. We don't want them there. And we're gonna put these in, what are these called? Straight top plate hardware. And that's what our feet are gonna screw into. And we're just gonna do it on all four corners. And so then we'll have beautiful feet instead of an ugly, 
triangular base. <laughs> All right, now we're getting to the good stuff. We get to hang our doors. Now, funny story, I don't know how many dozens of antique brass hinges I have removed from cabinets over the years. Now, when I need some of those, I can't find them anywhere. So what I had to do is spray paint some silver ones and antique and age them to look like all of those brass hinges that I have removed. <laughs> I'm like, where are those now? Anyway, so we've got our faked antique brass hinges hilarious and the reason why i wanted to do that is because i have this really cool hardware knob that's like a ring and it was left over from a desk it didn't end up going on it and i thought it would look really pretty with this blue with the gold so all we're gonna do is take <laughs> take our drill <laughs> and we are going to put our hinges on and I'm gonna make sure that we keep the distance the same on both of them. So then we're gonna take a Sharpie and we are going to mark where our hinges need to go. So we'll make sure that this is lined up how we want it. And then we are going to mark so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually drill it in and then pull it back out just to get it started and then we can do it with our cabinet hanging. Then we just drill a hole for our pretty knob. I am over the moon happy with how this extreme transformation on this piece of furniture turned out in the end. This was something that a lot of people might have passed over, but I am so glad I didn't. This will be a beautiful piece to store supplies in my craft room for years to come. A couple of months ago, I was in Home Depot and I saw a bunch of these kind of just sitting around. And I'm like, what is that? Because I thought that was kind of cool because it had like a groove in the center. And they're like, oh, we just use that for packaging. We toss them when they're done. And I'm like, can I have those? So I took a few of them. Now it has some writing on this one. Not all of them did. But I figured with a good sanding and some stain that this would look really cool for something. I'm gonna give it a good sanding and then we're gonna stain it with my bottomless pit stain. I've had this for a year and it's probably still half full and I really like the color and it's just gel stain that like won't ever go away. <laughs> so I love this. Then I have a scrap piece of wood. Now I have a whole bunch of cutoffs from my built-in shelf unit that you see behind me here. A lot of times people just leave their scrap pieces that they don't need at Home Depot. Well, Home Depot will sell them at a discount and make some extra money off of them, but you're paying for the whole sheet, so you might as well keep them. Look at this. It fits perfectly inside this. I do need to trim it down. And so if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I'm a huge proponent for the ladies using the power tools. And of course, I've got my safety goggles on here. Now I wanted to show you how easy it's gonna be to make this simple cut on our sliding miter compound saw. Sorry, said that wrong. Compound sliding miter saw. And the way we do that is right now it's stationary. So if I go up and down, it's just gonna chop. I don't believe that it will cut all the way through. We'll end up with like a little piece not cut. That would be okay because we could flip it over and cut the other side. But if we want it to be kind of nice and smooth and seamless, I've got this as an option. So there's this dial right here. We're gonna loosen this up and now this will slide back and forth. So when I make the cut, I can slide it forward cut from here and then slide it backward as we're cutting and then it will be one seamless cut. So I just wanted to show you how easy it would be and now we're gonna do it. So we're just gonna set this on here. We're gonna take our blade, set it down and line it up 
to where the line hits the edge of the blade. I'm gonna just clamp this down so it doesn't move on us and that will just make it a little easier. And then we're gonna pull our slider compound out. We're gonna pull the trigger and the handle. That was so easy to do. So I know that you can do this too. And now we're gonna just test out to see if it's gonna fit in our little block here. And I believe that it will. Perfect. I take my electric sander and give my base piece a good sanding. I was even able to remove the writing on it. Then I take my gel stain and stain the entire thing and give it a couple of hours to dry. I thought we could put a really cute saying and what's fun about this is it it's, can be completely reversible so we can put a saying on either side if we want. So today I'm only going to do one saying and then maybe down the road I'll come up with another saying that I want to do. So I went ahead and designed something in Cricut Design Studio that says there's no place like home. I used Times New Roman font for one and then the scripty font is called Rossi and then I decided to add a little heart to make it a little bit cute. One once we have our vinyl cut, I weed it, which is my favorite part. <laughs> then we apply our decal onto my wood piece that I painted with leftover paint from my shelf. Then I do a quick distressing on the edges of everything to just give it a little bit of a rustic feel. Then I just place the wood piece into our base and that's it. We can really put this anywhere in our house. It's such a flexible piece of decor that only cost 90 cents, which is basically the half of sheet of vinyl that we used. This is my favorite of all the projects. My next trash to treasure is I have this silverware box. I picked it up at the Goodwill. It was originally $5.99 and it was 50% off, so that made it $3.00. It's not very cute. It's pretty boring. And I think a lot of people would just toss this because you've got staples poking out of it. You've got this worn down purple felt, but it's functional and it's made of wood. And so I thought we could do something with this. So this has been sitting around my house for a while now, just waiting for the right opportunity to do something with it. We're going to paint it out, put some stripes on it. I have this leftover fabric from a pillow I made for my master bedroom. And I thought that it would line the inside really, really well. And so it's going to be kind of grays and whites mostly, and then a little hint of black. So I just spray it with gray primer that I had on hand and I don't care about if I get it on the interior fabric or not because it's very ugly and it's going to be covered up anyway. Then I take it inside where I find center and I was out of painter's tape so I used washi tape instead and I had to double it up to make the width of the stripe that I wanted. Now I would recommend just using regular painter's tape if you have it because I ended up having to do a little touch up paint where it leaked in the middle but I go ahead and make stripes using the tape as a guide. Then I take some white paint that I had on hand and paint the whole top of the box, but we leave the bottom half solid. Once it's dry, we can remove the tape and distress it. Then I take the vinyl decal, which in French loosely means all of the beautiful things I wear in a box. To prevent it from bleeding, I decided to go ahead and use Mod Podge. I would not recommend this because when I pulled back my decal, it also pulled up some of my painted lettering, which was kind of a bummer. Had I just left it alone, I think it would have peeled back much better. By the way, if you are cutting this on your Cricut, I would suggest cutting it on the washi tape setting since the lettering is kind of fine. So to fix my Mod Podge mistake, I just took a Sharpie and filled it in by hand, which ended up being just fine because I distressed my design anyway to give it kind of an aged feel. So you really couldn't tell in the end. So then I lined the interior of the box with some leftover fabric using spray glue and folding the edges under and using hot glue.
on the bottom outside part, I glue it to the edge and then use a rotary cutter to just cut it off. If you're doing this project, you wanna make sure your fabric is relatively thin so that your box will still close. I love how this turned out. I can store my jewelry and any meaningful mementos that I like. So including the original cost of the box, supplies and paint and everything, I would say that this is less than $5, but we'll just call it that. And I think it was worth every penny. All right, so for my next trash to treasure, I have some empty bottles. Now, my family really likes Indian food, and this is like a simmer sauce that we use for dinner. I like the shape of them because they're kind of square, but they are round up top, and I thought that that would make for some interesting decor sometimes, so I've been hanging on to these. My original plan for these bottles was to spray paint them black and then white chalk paint, and then sand them down a little bit, but I didn't end up having enough white chalk paint, so after I sprayed painted them black, I ended up just using some white gloss spray paint that I picked up at Walmart for 97 cents and already had on hand making the black spray paint really unnecessary for what I ended up doing in the end. Once the spray paint was dry I brought them in and took some black chalk paint and decided to give it kind of an enamel wear look. I achieved this by taking a sponge brush and just randomly placing black around the rim and the bottom of the jar Perfection is not what we're going for here. We want it to look like it's been chipped and down to the iron. Then we do a couple of chippy spots in random locations on the bottle, trying to be a little different from each of the other four bottles. And then finally, we are gonna go into Cricut Design Studio and we're just gonna write the word home. It will be one letter per jar. And then of course we weed it and put transfer tape on it and cut out each individual letter and apply one letter to each bottle. To style it, I used some boxwood that I already had on hand from Walmart in the jars, but you could style it however you like not including the boxwood these jars came in including paint and vinyl around a dollar fifty for all four not too bad now if you're like me you might be asking yourself is a cricket really worth it and the answer for me is yes i wished i'd got one years and years ago because I'm having so much fun with my Cricut machine. Up front, it is an investment, but over the long haul, you are going to save money if you like to decorate. If you can't afford one now, start saving for one because they are just a blast. I love them. I really do. So my next farmhouse trash to treasure, I'm going to be using this sign to make a cute sign out of. Now I got this at the Dollar Tree. I know a lot of people probably have the, these type of signs on hand. They sell them a lot at the Dollar Tree. I was going to use it as part of my DIY wreath stand that I made a couple of weeks ago in an episode. And I decided that I didn't want to mess around with it. I found something a little bit heavier. All we're going to do is we're going to flip this over and we're going to paint the exterior in a black chalk paint and then we are gonna paint the interior in a white paint and Cricut is doing something really cool right now they've released a whole bunch of free designs for you to work with and so you just go into Cricut Design Studio click on the image section and filter it by free stuff and I found this really cute sign that says be kind and I thought that that would look really cute in my kitchen because I have a little honey jar that's like a beehive and has little bees on it and I thought that that would make a really cute vignette and it's so easy all we need to do is click on the image adjust the size and hit make it and our project is done. They've made it really easy for you. There are so many images that they have to choose from right now, so go and check out their free stuff in the Cricut Design Studio. I know you won't be disappointed. After we apply the vinyl decal to the inside of our frame, I decide to dress up the outside of the frame a little bit with some black and white polka dotted scrapbook paper that I already had on hand. I ended up folding it 
over the edge to see how wide I needed it to be and then use my paper cutter to cut it down. Then I just take the scrapbook paper and Mod Podge it to the outside of the frame and then I sand it down to kind of distress the whole thing. I just think this is so cute, especially for just barely over a dollar. I have this kind of cute farmhouse looking soap pump that sits in my kitchen. It's cute, but I thought we could make it a little cuter and customize it a little bit by adding a label to it. So on the free section of Cricut, they have a whole bunch of free label designs. So I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to put something more custom on our soap dispenser and use that as a backdrop for a fun little saying, wash your hands, you filthy animal. <laughs> now I saw the humor in that, I hope you do too. And so we're just gonna put that on our label and this is a really simple project and it is so cute and a little bit of humor and to remind my kids especially to wash their hands because they're filthy little animals. <laughs> All this needed was a label so that came under just 50 cents. Okay, so this is the piece that we're gonna be working on and this is an Ikea Malm three drawer dresser. And as I've said, we purchased this home fully furnished, so this was here. It just is not gonna work with the decor, the direction I wanna take the decor. We're gonna do something with it, but what I do like about it is the functionality, the size, and all of that is good. It's just too modern. It's not something that I would have picked out for myself. If you have a piece of furniture that you had a long time and you don't really like the way it looks, I hope this episode inspires you to make it over to something that you do like. So we are gonna take this from modern to more of a farmhouse chic, if you will. We are gonna do that by adding some trim and then we're gonna put some mirrors on it. There's something about mirrors that really just makes a piece more glamorous. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some trim, we're gonna add some paint, add some mirrors and some crystal knobs and it will look nothing like it when we are done. And that for me is a good thing. Okay, so we're gonna start by adding some trim. And what I have here is a one and a half by 36 inch, and it's a half inch thick um, piece of craft wood that I picked up at Home Depot. It was about 250 um, for this here. And you can do this like one of two ways. You can either measure it out, which is a good way to go. Um, but a lot of times what I like to do is just hold it up and take a pin and mark the back side. So now I'm gonna take you outside to show you how to use a miter saw. All right, what do you think of the glasses? Aren't they attractive? Well, being safe is attractive. You just don't want anything getting in your eye and causing any damage. It's just not worth it. We are gonna take our piece that we have marked and we are just gonna set it down here on our miter saw. This is a Chicago electric. It was very affordable. This is like a perfect starter saw. And it also has a couple of really awesome features like a laser. So you can line your markup with a laser and know that it's in the right spot. Then it also has this handy clamp that you can just clamp your piece of wood so it's in place. So that's all set. And then in order to work the saw, we release it by pulling in that button and then here you pull it in and then you pull on that and that starts it up. So let's make our cut. Hey honey, you like You're my- You're so hot. My husband thinks I'm hot with these glasses on, so it's okay. <laughs> All right, so for this next part, I am going to be using my most favorite power tool, and that is my finish nailer that's hooked up to an air compressor. So to switch these out or to put them on in the first place, you simply pull back this little thing right there and insert that in and then let it go. I like this dial to be right in the middle. So that's 150 here and 80 here. And you'll know if you need more pressure or less pressure by how far the nail goes in. So if it's not going all the way into the wood, you know you need to turn this dial right here and increase the pressure or decrease the pressure. And then all you do is turn it on. All right, so I've got this laying down on its back. It's just gonna make it easier for us to work with it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna flip it over and just pick one side 
And I'm just putting a little bit of Gorilla Wood glue on the back and this is just to kind of add a little bit of security. And then we will flip it over right up here by the top where we're gonna line it up. And I'm just gonna jiggle it a little bit to kind of work out some of that glue. And then we are going to take our favorite tool, the finish nailer. And we are just gonna pop a few nails in for good measure. So I do it one side and then the other side. And then one in the middle. And that should be good. And then we'll just do this on all of it. And then if you have any wood glue squeeze out, just kind of wipe off the excess with a rag or your finger like me. <laughs> I have like a bazillion of these and they always wander off. So we've got our extra piece that we're gonna use for the side slats. And what we're gonna do is just measure in between. So I can see that it's slightly under five inches, just barely. And so we're gonna make that mark and then we're gonna go cut. I don't want to forget the ends. They're kind of boring too. So I'm going to add the same trim, except for a little wider. This one's like a one and a half and this is like a two and a half. So it's a little bit wider. It's the same process on the sides as on the fronts. All right, so next up, we need to fill in the nail holes, all the cracks and crevices and get it all nice and tight. So I just got some spackle and we're just going to wipe that in there and then we'll let it dry all right so we're all spackled and it looks good we've got to let this dry and we worked hard so it's a chocolate break time i really like york peppermint patties what's your little reward of choice so chocolate break so our spackle is dried and i am ready to sand this now I'm gonna speed up the process with my electric sander, but I'm gonna finish it out and do the final finishing touches with a sanding sponge. And the reason I'm gonna use the sander is again to speed it up, but also to kind of hit up this surface, which is actually gonna be the only part of the original piece that's really gonna get paint on it. That will help the paint adhere to the piece a little bit better. So we'll just sand. All right, so I've got all of the big stuff. So now I'm just gonna come in here and do a few finishing touches with my sanding sponge. But without that electric sander, this would have been a much longer process. So I highly recommend an electric sander. So one coat of primer and two coats of paint. And that is on everywhere that is not receiving a mirror. I'm taking you on a little field trip because I decided to leave glass cutting to the pros. I reached out to Statewide Glass in Kissimmee, Florida, and they are cutting them for me. They've been so helpful and so great to work with, and they're giving me a great deal. So you can't ask for more, and I get to avoid an emergency room trip. So I'm almost there. I am back, and I have my mirrors, and we get to make this look so glamorous. But before we permanently attach our mirror to the drawer, I want to do a dry fitting. So I had the mirror store pre-drilled where the knobs would go. And so I just want to pre-drill those in the wood and it fits like a glove. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a Sharpie and then we're gonna just mark where the knobs go. We're gonna take our drill and pre-drill those holes. So now that we've got our holes drilled, we are gonna just apply some of this liquid nails and I'm just gonna do it kind of in an S shape and then put your mirror right into place. It should go in without any issues. And then just jiggle it back and forth just slightly. There should be a little bit of wiggle room and then just make sure your holes are all lined up. I decided to bring the party upstairs to the bedroom where it's actually going to be sitting. Um, I plan on doing a full bedroom makeover over the next month or so, so stay tuned for those. So I am going to just squeeze on a whole bunch of adhesive. Woo! That got me. Statewide Glass recommended that I, since it's going on top, that I should do a quarter inch thick. I did one eighth inch everywhere else. So that's what this is. That looks perfect. So now to hold it into place while it dries 
and you should do this on all the pieces. Just use blue tape because it will hold it in place without ruining the paint. All right, there's a reason why this is going in mommy's room and not a kid's room, and it's because it does fingerprint. And we've handled the, the mirrors a lot, so now it's time to clean them off and get it all sparkly. So now it's time to add a little jewelry. These crystal knobs, I actually got off of Amazon. I stopped buying knobs and hardware in the big box stores a long time ago. It is so much more affordable and cheaper to buy it off of online, whether it's eBay or Amazon. So I'll put the link to these below, but these ended up being like 83 cents a knob at the big box stores, it was gonna be $4 a knob, so this is a huge savings and it's something I highly recommend. One little side note, because we did add the mirror, we do need to get a little bit longer screw, so I went out and got one and a quarter inch. They come with one inch, so just hang on to those for another time, you might need them later. You wanna be sure to put these on just tight enough that they're on secure and not so tight that it cracks your glass, so just be careful of that. to the Goodwill. I have driven 45 minutes to go to this Goodwill because I just have not had the best luck thrifting in my area. I'm hoping to find a bench today because we are knocking off a Pottery Barn bench and I'm gonna teach you how to do a slip cover. Wish me luck. I've been struggling to find a good thrift store here. If not, I've got a good backup and we will go with it on Facebook Marketplace. But I just wanted to see what I could find. I think I might have hit the mother load because it says Goodwill Outlet and I'm hoping that that means like some really deeply discounted stuff. I hope all of my thrifting dreams are about to come true. No dice. Uh, it was kind of the most different Goodwill I have ever been to. Everything was just in this giant bin. I mean, I guess that's why they call it an outlet. I have another idea, so I'm gonna give that a try and hopefully we'll have some luck. No dice. So now we're gonna try the Habitat for Humanity Restore. Okay, no luck at Habitat Restore. So I think it's time to go with the Facebook find. I should have just done that to begin with, but I'm really trying to find some good thrift stores and I just not. So we are back from our thrifting adventures and I still haven't found a good thrift store. So if you know good thrifting for furniture and home decor items in the greater Orlando area, hook a girl up. And I love thrifting, but we succeeded in the end and we found this off of the Facebook marketplace. And I learned from that experience that if you find something that works, just go get it. In my case, I was just hoping to find some good thrifting along the way, which I didn't, but I did end up with a good bench. And this floral fabric is so pretty. <laughs> when I was looking for a piece, I really wanted something that was about the same dimensions as the original, and this is that. It's a little bit narrower, not much, but other than that, the width and the height and all of that is good for what we're looking for. What we're gonna be doing is a slip cover. Doing a slip cover, especially on a bench like this, this is straight stitching. You can handle it, I promise, and I'm gonna show you how to do it. The first thing we're gonna do is this was tufted with just a couple of buttons, and we're gonna remove those in our inspiration piece it was smooth and I'm also gonna go ahead and try to remove this piping because I don't want it to be a bump in our slip covers now this part is completely optional you don't have to do this this is just my own personal preference because I think that there might be a little bit of indentations from where the buttons were I am just gonna add a layer of batting that I already had on hand that's left over from my dining room chair makeover. If you haven't seen that episode, I'll put the link in the description box below. Watch that afterwards. I totally transformed my dining room chairs. That's another one if you're interested in reupholstery or slip covering. I wanted to show you the fabric that I got to match this one. I went into 
Joann's and I found this which is pretty much spot on honestly it's a really good match this is by Nate Burkus it was regularly $19.99 a yard and of course they have sales on their home decor fabric pretty much most of the time and this is 50% off so it was $9.99 a yard which is really good for home decor fabric which can really run you a lot of money so let's flip this over and see if we did a good job this is the moment of truth and I think we did so then what we're gonna do is you're gonna want to measure the top and I kind of already know that we're about 48 inches by and I think this is about 18 inches nope 16 <laughs> so I'm gonna cut out it to be a little bit bigger because you want to allow for kind of like a seam allowance so I'm gonna cut it out to 49 by 17 which is not a ton but I don't want it to be like uber big so I kind of want it sitting on top we want to measure the top to the ground so after you have all of your measurements, I suggest adding about three quarters inch to each side for seam allowances. And since we are basically cutting out a bunch of rectangles, all you really need to do is add an inch and a half to all of your dimensions when you're cutting out your fabric. Since there's no curving pieces, it's pretty simple. But anytime I make a slip cover, I typically add about three quarter inch extra for all seam allowances. Since this is a stripe fabric, I try to center all of my stripes on the middle so that it balances out and is not off-centered. And then when you're doing a hem, I allot for about an inch for the hem on the bottom and three quarters for the seam allowance up top. This is really simple. You don't have to do any weird cuts. And then we'll do some end pieces to put underneath to um, for the corners so you don't see this floral fabric poking through because that wouldn't be very pretty. For those of you who are beginning to sewing or have never sewn before, this is actually a pretty easy project and I believe that you can do this. I do have a video, it's one of my few videos over on IGTV where I show you how to thread a machine, how to thread a bobbin, and also how to do a straight stitch. And I'll put the link to that in the description box below. So if you've never done that before, you can go over and refer to that video to get some basic sewing skills. We're going to start by doing a finished edge on all of the side pieces, leaving four and a half inches not sewn at the top where they will be attached to each other. Now, the proper way to do this is finish all the edges with zigzag or a serger. I don't do it a lot of times and I find it's okay. The problem is, is when you go to wash it, that's when you really have the issues. So I will tell you, you probably ought to do your finished edges with a zigzag, but I'm probably not going to. Don't judge. <laughs> because our piece is striped, and isn't it like looking so beautiful with my other stripes? It's not clashing at all. <laughs> Anyways, because it's striped, I want to be very careful about how I go about the piping. So that's what we're gonna do right now is work on the piping and make sure that it all lines up. So I cut my fabric to one and a half inch and then I'll put my piping inside and we'll sew a seam. But before I do that, I wanna make sure that all of our stripes line up and that when we go around back, that they will all be lined up. We'll cut this on the edges to match up with the stripes. We'll also make sure that the stripes line up with the side pieces as well. So we want all of the piping to line up stripe-wise with each of our pieces. So in order to do that, we just need to take a little bit more time than normally. Normally I say the piping doesn't matter all that much, but when you're doing stripes like this, it kind of matters. This will take a little bit extra time, but it will be totally worth it in the end. And it will make our knockoff all the more convincing. Because I was so concerned about making sure that the stripes matched up, I'm doing my piping a little bit different. So I wanted to tell you and show you kind of what I've got going on. First of all, I really like to use 5.30 seconds piping. I buy it in bulk um, off of Amazon because it's the cheapest that way. It ends up being like, I don't know, 25 cents a yard. So it's like ridiculously cheap and we're gonna end up needing oh, maybe three yards at the most. So that ends up being like 75 cents for our project, super cheap. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and lined up all of the stripes and you can see, and then I've already, sewn the seams together on the corners and I'm gonna just when I make my piping I'm gonna do it as I go 
and that way I know that my stripes are gonna match up. A lot of times I'll just pre-make a whole bunch of piping and just go to town because it doesn't really matter because there's a busy pattern or something like that. Because of the stripes, I'm just gonna do it as I go and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my piping and we are gonna place it inside about right in the center right there and we are going to wrap our fabric around it and make sure that it's tucked right back in and then as we go we're going to just stitch it to the fabric stitch it right in place and then we will know our stripes will match up that's not normally how i do it but i think for this situation it's the best option I leave the first couple of inches of my piping unsewn until we get to the end and you'll see why. Also when I do the piping I use my zipper foot and we will pretty much be using this for the remainder of the project. This helps you get right up next to the piping without it pushing it out of the way. When you get to the corner leave the needle in the fabric, lift up the presser foot and turn the fabric and then replace the presser foot and sew again. When you get to the end, you are going to make sure that the piping is cut to where the corner is, but leave about an inch of extra fabric, which we will then fold back and wrap around the beginning piece. I did this on the corner this time, but normally I do not do that. I like to do it on the straight edge because it makes it a little bit easier, but doing this process gives it a much more finished feel instead of crisscrossing and cutting them off. It just looks better this way. So really funny, I had exactly the amount of thread in my bobbin to finish this. It ran out literally as we were finishing our piping. This is the hardest part, so now it's gonna be smooth sailing from here and we're gonna attach the skirt. Okay, so now we're gonna stitch each corner of the skirt together. Then after that, we're gonna put the corner flaps on to hide anything from the corners. <laughs> So the way I go about pinning the top to the sides is I always start at the corners. I always stick pins in my mouth. I know it's not the safest, but <laughs> it's how I do it. Don't do this at home. If my mom's watching, sorry. <laughs> I know you taught me better. <laughs> so I find the corner and I match it up to the seam and I put a pin there. And then I move to the center in our case, we have perfect places to put pins. We're just gonna put them at every stripe corner just to make sure that all of the stripes line up. So we'll just go ahead and get this all pinned up and then we're gonna sew it on. And then the last thing that we'll need to do is just hem it and it will be done. And we'll see how good of a knockoff I did. <laughs> Okay, so I wanna show you one boo-boo that happened. It's bound to happen. I've been sewing for 30 years, 30 plus <laughs> years, even with all of that experience under my belt. Things happen when you're working with a lot of different layers of fabric. So I'm gonna show you that. There's a boo-boo right here in the corner. And then there's one thing that I want to tweak that I want to get a little closer to the original. And that is just to tighten it up in the corner so it, it slightly pulls. Um, in the original, you'll notice that up on the corners, it kind of pulls in and is a little bit snug. I almost think it looks kind of like a mistake, you know, like it's pulling like a little too tight, tighter than it should. But for the sake of the dupe, we're gonna imitate it and go for that look as well. Okay, so you can kind of see right here that I puckered up and all what we'll do is we'll just kind of unpick this and we'll just redo this tiny section here. We don't need to redo the whole thing. We'll just rip open the seam here, smooth that out and fix that error. And here to get it to pull, we'll just tighten up the seam a little bit more so that it kind of pulls a little bit like the original. Instead of doing a traditional hem, I decide to use peel and stick fusing tape so you can't see any stitching. This seems to match the original the best. My hem ended up being one and a quarter inch and it's as easy as peeling and sticking the fuse tape to the fabric and pressing it on. So the advertised price on the website was $950, but I wanted to see the actual price once you included shipping. So I went through the checkout process and discovered that by the time you add shipping and tax and all of that, you're into it $1,170.
and you're gonna have to wait six weeks to get it. As far as knockoffs are concerned, I feel like this is about as close as you can come. I ended up spending around $48, which is less than 5% of the original cost. And so for a 95% savings, that's pretty good. I, I don't know that it, I could stomach forking over all of that extra cash. If you enjoyed this episode, here's another one that I think you'll like as well. And to all my DIY Niners, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.